All right, guys, welcome back to the continuing step one lecture right now. We were up to DNA repair. I put the page numbers there for my book, page 40 and page 62 of the blank first day 2021. Uh, last time we left off after a discussion of the LAC operon, and before that we had already discussed topics of mutations in DNA and how DNA replication occurs. Keep in mind that right now we're going to be doing all the principles in this lecture series and knocking out everything that uh, First Aid has to talk about in terms of biochem, immunology, micropath, farm, and then public health sciences, which includes ethics. Once we're done with the principal topics, we're going to approach the organ systems in a combined manner where, we're, where I'm going to talk about both the Step 1 cardiovascular as well as Step 2 CK cardiovascular topics together. What you may not have noticed is that oftentimes those Step 1 questions on any QBank you try will have information that you may not have really understood, like why they're doing an echo, why they're ordering an ultrasound, why they're following up one screening protocol with a different screening protocol, and so on. Those things are stuff that is going to be critical in step two, right, where you're going to get a question and then they're going to ask you what should you order next, and you have to be able to pick correctly whether you're going to order, order an ultrasound, x-ray, or MRI, depending on whatever's wrong. This is becoming even more significant now, now that the Step 2 CS is gone, where literally part of that exam was after the whole communication aspect in the physical exam uh, uh, that you had to do with your fake patient. The major part of that was putting down your top three diagnoses and what tests you would order, right? What do you think needs to be ordered to further confirm the diagnosis of whatever patient uh, dilemma you have? So now that the CS is permanently gone, thank God, um, CK is going to be testing even more of that and step one is starting to test more of CK topics. This is the new trend of things that are changing in the back uh, where you know we're not really going to know about this until you sit down for your test where even now you can see if you've been doing QBanks that step one QBanks are starting to ask you what should you do next to manage this patient? What should you order for that patient? And the other thing I want to tell you guys, when you study organ systems in this collaborative manner of looking at both step one and step two together, what often happens is that you start seeing the trend. You'll notice that because exam A and C were ordered, maybe an ultrasound was ordered or some other procedure was done, whatever, because of these two procedures that were done, the diagnosis must be X. You know, th This little connection, you'll start making it. You'll start seeing that very evidently in questions such that when you read a question and you see that, oh, okay, so they ordered an echo. That means this must be some kind of congenital heart defect, you know, and then you move on from there. And depending on what they saw in the echo, you'll have a better understanding of what the congenital heart defect might be. There's a lot involved in these organ systems, and the point of my lecture series has always been to make it commonsensical, but also make it stick to you, not that you have to revise it or come back to it again. So when we get there, eventually, we'll start mastering these organ system problems in such a way that you will never really tend to forget it. But before that, we need to master these principles in such a way that it sticks to you forever. So if you watched everything up to here, then everything we've done up to here, which I've labeled, or these, these numbered things are the topics we've covered, they should stick to you perfectly. You shouldn't have any issues really trying to figure out what's happening. You know, when you when you see mutations in DNA, you should know exactly what they are. You should be able to talk to me about them, tell me what they look like, what the differences are, and the examples I've given and stuff like that. Same thing with the lac operon, complete understanding of the adenylate cyclase, cyclic AMP, the cap, the regulator, promoter, operator, etc. All of that should be just perfectly commonsensical. No hesitation can be available, right? You don't have time for hesitation. You don't have time for doubt, right? When you sit down for your step one, you can't be in a position of doubt because then when you look at the answer choices, they're just going to further amplify the doubt that you've harvested. So now moving on to DNA repair, this has always been a topic that as far as I've seen, many students t uh, seem to struggle with. So, um, you know, if, if you signed up for my course, then you have a lot of other notes from me and access to some of my uh, original work. And if you don't know about it, you can feel free to shoot me an email. My email should be down there in the description. Um, signing up for my course has been extremely beneficial for the students that are part of it right now. I teach a combo course for Step 1 and Step 2 CK. And uh, everyone that's a part of it is just beyond amazed by the work. Because like I've literally had students uh, actually drop out of courses they signed up for elsewhere, like something called the PAT program and whatnot just because they felt like this was a better investment for them and their time, right? So for more details on that, feel free to shoot me an email. Let's dive right into here. So DNA repair, 
Um, they they changed up the layout in the first day 2021 uh, page, but uh, I'm gonna read out of my uh, own first day 2020 annotations, and then we'll go back to the first day 2021 to look at things as necessary. And this research stuff is always critical. In fact, I highly urge students that when you're studying these things, that you often go back and Google things and look a little more up on them as necessary. So they break it down as double strand versus single strand, right? And in the double strand you have the topics of non-homologous end joining versus homologous recombination. Now these two are not that high yield of a topic. They're not the biggest topic around. Uh, so they tell you that non-homologous end joining basically does exactly what the name says. Non-homologous, so you don't need homology in between the chromosomes and they're joined. It brings together two ends of DNA fragments that repair double strand breaks. This is going to be defective in patients who have ataxia to injectation. That's the, the core of the pathophysiology of that disease. Uh, for doing non-homologous end joining, you don't need homology and some DNA can be lost. So when you join DNA that wasn't really homologous to each other but it fixes the problem, you could lose a little bit of DNA and that can end up being a little detrimental for the person. With homologous recombination, you actually require two homologous DNA duplexes. The images that are given in First Day 2021 do a nice simple job, but if you don't uh, like that or if you feel that's not enough, you can always Google more images and get a better understanding of how it actually visually occurs. It helps oftentimes to see the, uh, uh, the act actually taking place visually. A strand from a damaged double-stranded DNA is repaired using a complementary strand from an intact homologous or similar double-stranded DNA as a template. So that's pretty obvious stuff, right? So if you have uh, a building that was supposed to be repaired, you can look at another building that might be the same design and just copy everything over, right? And then you fix the first building. So that's basically what's happening there. This is going to be defective in burka issues, right? Defective in breast and ovarian cancers regarding burka one uh, and in Fanconi anemia, which is actually a topic not many people know very well. Fanconi anemia, let's talk about that real quick. Fanconi anemia is actually really uh, a very specific type of anemia that if you don't have it down uh, the first time you study it, you'll probably never really tend to remember it. That's kind of how silly it is. So coming back to, I'm trying to find it right now in my uh, CK annotations, because it's, it's definitely a topic there. So right here I have an image I'm going to put over here for you guys from Coney Anemia. So looking at this, you can kind of see what's happening. Let me fit it into the screen. Make sure uh, my camera is not blocking it off. I'm going to put it right there. So if you look at Fanconeumia, right here you can see uh, it's a genetic dis DNA repair disorder that may lead to bone marrow failure, leukemia, and or solid tumors caused by one of at least 23 genes and can affect all systems. It's inherited in an autosomal recessive manner and one in 131,000 Fanconeumia occurs almost equally in males and females. Right, So this is a pretty high prevalence. You don't want one in every 131,000 people to have this. Uh, approximately 31 babies born each year with Fanconeumia. Now there are some things that happen to patients who have Fanconia anemia that make it a very easy answer choice to pick. One of the key abnormalities, as you can see right here, are the uh, hand and thumb abnormalities. Uh, you're going to see in your question stem they'll describe something about the fingers not being um, normal. You know, there, if you look at your hand, you're supposed to have two indentations on your thumb and then three on each of your other fingers and uh, your thumb is supposed to be smaller and there's a little bit of a height differential that occurs uh, across the, the fingers from one finger to the other. That is not going to be normal in them. Right? In their whole body, there's going to be a lot of uh, diff difficulties with their CBC, so abnormal blood count, bone marrow failure, leukemia, dermatologic issues like possibly even eczema, hormone deficiency, and they'll have a short stature. They'll try to confuse this with a couple other things too. They'll throw in things in the question that might make you think of Turner syndrome or whatever, but Turner doesn't really have much to do with anemia per se, right? Um, and the finger thing is usually going to be the number one way for you to figure out what's actually happening. Other than that, there are many other things that are tossed in here, which really sets this aside from the general scope of anemias we've looked at, right? Where iron deficiency anemia versus anemia of chronic disease was one of the biggest uh, topics because those guys both look like they have iron deficiency, but in um, anemia or chronic disease, which usually has a patient with some chronic disease like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, they actually have iron, but it's been stored away, right? So their ferritin is going to be high, and that's kind of how you differentiate the two. 
those were some big topics. And then the other anemias were all based off of whether there was a heme problem or a globin problem like thalassemias or whether there was macrocytic anemia because you have vitamin uh, B9 or B12 deficiency, stuff like that, right? Here, though, you're seeing a whole different conglomeration of symptoms. So Fanconi anemia is a pretty big specific topic that is also going to test you on this topic of homologous recombination. Homologous recombination just doesn't work in them that well, in most of them. Um, that takes care of the DNA repairs for double strands. That's generally all there is for that. Uh, every time you see these genes, like Burka 1 is mentioned here, Burka, every time you see that, you should go back. So I'm going to tell you what page it is in um, First Aid 2020. There's that page where they list off all the oncogenes and the tumor suppressor genes, right? That page tells you the differences between each of these genes and the associations of various cancers that are involved. Now, if you look at it, BRCA1 and BRCA2, those are tumor suppressor genes, BRCA, right? I always remember that because I, I you know, when you pronounce the word BRCA, it kind of reminds you of the BRCA that Arabic uh, and Islamic countries have. Um, not, It's not a suppressive thing. People wear BRCAs because they want to. It's not a suppressive thing at all. But because some people do see it as a form of suppression, it, it just stuck to me, right? It stuck to me that... Burka is a tumor suppressor gene. That's it. That's all I'm using that statement for. Burkas are not a suppression of the people or anything like that. A whole different political conversation. But that's not even a political thing. It's a religious outfit that people wear because they want to. Right? And of course there are, sure, people that are forced into it. But that's a whole different thing. Point is, I used that concept to memorize this. Right? So now I never forgot that Burka is a tumor suppressor gene. Right? Because of the word suppression. And if you look at the associated conditions, it says breast, ovarian, and pancreatic cancer. This is going to be really high yield, right? So this is a form of shock studying. This entire thing we're doing, by the way, I call it shock studying, where we started off with the topic of um, DNA repair. We moved over to Fanconia anemia. Now we're talking about oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. You want to make sure you have complete qualitative studying of every topic you ever approach. Every time you see any of these genes, you want to go back to this page where they list off the oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes under the pathology neoplasia section. This is page 225 of First Aid 20, uh, 2020. So right here, when you see this, this is to tell you that when you get a patient who has breast and ovarian cancer, it's probably breast cancer due to BRCA, right? Or breast and pancreatic cancer, BRCA, right? The other one is HER2. That is an oncogene. Remember that the difference was tumor suppressors or suppressors. You have two of them. If one of them dies, the other one can still suppress the tumor. If they both die, now you can't suppress tumors, but it's still not the worst case scenario because you just can't suppress tumors. That doesn't mean you're going to make tumors, right? But then it follows the two-hit rule. With oncogenes, just like the name implies, it turns on cancer. So that's much worse. You just need one mutation to turn on the cancer, and you're literally actively going to be forming cancers. HER2 is an oncogene. The way I also memorized that was that you have to turn her on, is a, is a sentence you could say, right? So HER2 is an oncogene, and it actually only is related to or has associated neoplasms of breast and gastric cancer. So I further completed that center, sentence with turn her on by playing with her breast and feeding her food. Boom, it sticks, it's perfect, you'll never forget it, right? The reason this is important is because you can get questions where they give you these bullshit details, right? They'll tell you things like, oh, this patient has breast cancer, it looks like the issue is due to an oncogene, what would you give them to treat this? Well, if you have breast cancer due to an oncogene, it has to be the HER2 mutation, and to treat the HER2 mutation, you use trastuzumab, which you can memorize because you should not trust her. This sentence further gets completed by saying, don't trust her, she will break your heart, because trastuzumab is actually cardiotoxic. These, these sentences aren't even mnemonics, these are just great sentences that people say on an, you know basic times and whatever, uh, after heartbreak and silly stuff like that, and it just works, right? They're like funny remotely, and uh, it sticks to you, so you never ever forget it. You don't even need to come back and revise this ever again. So now if you have a patient with breast and gastric carcinomas, but it's not a pancreatic gastric carcinoma, but actually stomach cancer gastric carcinoma, then that's her too, right? So these associations are stuff that you need to have in mind perfectly, and the burka, um, burka versus, you know, the burka is what we were looking at right now. That, that stuff is related to your um, non-homologous, and sorry, not non-homologous, the um, 
homologous recombination stuff, right? Non-homologous was just ataxia telangiotasia. So this thing was your ataxia telangiotasia. And the other guy, ooh, this is a long word. And the other guy, uh, homologous recombination, this is related to this and burka, right? So those are the two main associations where if that form of double strand repair is not working, then you can get burka breast cancer, gastric cancer, or sorry, burka related uh, breast, pancreatic, or ovarian cancer, or the Fanconi anemia. That's basically all that's happening here. Moving on, the next half of this, and excuse my cat, she's having a little bit of a moment. The next half of this topic itself is your single strand repair. This is the more high yield topic that gets tested, tested vigorously, if you ask me. Uh, this includes a separate group of things that had, this page, by the way, has been edited so many times. It's basically been edited every time a new first aid came out, which is another reason I urge that when you study these topics, you Google it, to try to see a little more about it on Wikipedia or any other resource that you want to kind of trust a little more than Wikipedia. Uh, the single strand stuff includes your nucleotide excision repair, your base excision repair, and the mismatch repair. Now, each of these, each of these uh, case scenarios is related to a very specific problem. Nucleotide excision repair, let's look at it in First Aid 2021. So that's, again, page, uh, oh, wow, actually, I wrote the wrong page here, excuse me. Page 39, so there's usually two pages I have to worry about, um, but pretty much the same page over here. Because what often happens is the page that's written on the top right of the actual book is different from the page of the PDF number. So that's a little bit of a mistake I often make. But I want to write here the, the page of the actual book. So this is page 39 of the book, First Day 2021. Um, so looking at it in First Day 2021, for single strand repair, nucleotide excision repair, they've written specific endonucleases release the oligonucleotides containing damaged bases. DNA polymerase and ligase then fill and reseal the gap, respectively. It repairs bulky helix distorting lesions, and this occurs in the G1 phase of the cell cycle. They then explain that this is defective in xeroderma pigmentosum, where you have an inability to repair DNA pyrimidine dimers, which are caused by ultraviolet exposure. It presents with dry skin, photosensitivity, and skin cancer, right? Squamous cell carcinoma and melanoma are also common complications in patients with xeroderma pigmentosum. So that's a big one to remember. So here we see that it occurs in G1 and it's mainly related to xeroderma pigmentosum. All right. So xeroderma pigmentosum now, you know, th there's a bunch of pictures for this topic all over the place, but what you're really just thinking of is squamous cell carcinoma. That's kind of what you're looking at. And you're trying to remember the aspect of UV exposure. Right. So you're going to get people who have maybe um, done a lot of... Um, sunbathing right so then at that point you want to make sure you understand that the sunbathing has put them at risk of forming primidine dimers right primidine dimers are forming and that's never something you really want right and it's hard to fix that hard to fix that if when you don't have nucleotide excision repair so now the the players here are also kind of key right the players where one endonucleases which we already talked about when we earlier discussed the dna replication stuff and all the different enzymes involved in unwinding and wrapping up and fixing DNA. Endonucleases are the ones that are going to cut things. They're going to cut the bad parts out. Right? They're going to cut that UV dimer out. How would you identify a UV dimer? Well, the dimer is going to be a bulky distortion that's going to kind of be easy to catch. Right? It's not going to It's not going to look nice. The DNA that is already there won't be nice and straight. Okay, The DNA is going to have a little bit of a bulk over here because of the pyrimidine dimer. All right? So that's something to keep in mind, and that's going to be fixed up with your nucleotide excision repair. Now, one of the ways I memorized this was I turned this into the phrase, let me move this down because it's kind of getting in the way with the Fanconi anemia part, so I'll put it right here. I wrote nerd, right? So this now you can easily perfectly remember that the problem is nucleotide excision repair, DNA, right? DNA primidine dimers, the D for dimers. So that's kind of what you put down D for dimers, right? Which again is re relevant to something we see later on, D dimers, right? D dimers are a thing that you're going to see when you look at DVTs and whatnot. So here the D is starting for dimers because of the primidine dimers you're making here. And the word nerd reminds you of people who basically sit at home and study all day so they never really go in the sun, right? That's all basically all of us med students. 
So that's the, the concept here, nucleotide excision repair. You should never get a question wrong where they maybe gave you a patient who had some kind of bulky distortion because they formed a dimer by being in sunlight. They're going to be like, what would you have to do to fix this? Or what phase would this be fixed in? It would be fixed in G1 with nucleotide excision repair. That's it. Very straightforward questions. All these questions are nice and straightforward regarding this, this topic. It's just that the confusion, it comes from not remembering things, right? So this is why we have this nerd thing to remember it. Base excision repair has the gel please mnemonic to it, which really is just telling you the um, the players, the players that are involved here. Um, and let me put do out first. Okay, so they tell you in uh, first day 2021, page 39, for base excision repair that the base specific glycosylase will remove the altered base and create an apurinic or apyrimidinic site. They're going to remove the the base that's messed up, the base that's not supposed to be there due to this mutation that has occurred. Then one or more nucleotides will be removed by AP endonuclease. Right, so glycosylase comes first now. As opposed to a nucleotide excision repair, there was no glycosylase. It was straight up endonuclease did its job, right? But here glycosylase comes first, then the endonuclease come and remove more nucleotides. And AP endonuclease is going to cleave the 5' prime uh, end, while lyase is going to uh, cleave the three prime end. So that's your gel mnemonic, right? Glycosylase, endonuclease, and lyase. Glycosylase is going to remove and create an apurinic site. Endonuclease cuts the five prime side. Lyase cuts the three prime side. Done. Now you have to fix it. So to fix it, you have the PL from please. P is just your polymerase, the guy that makes DNA. It's going to make DNA to fill the gap. And ligase, that second L we have here, is the guy that seals the newly built stuff in, right? Uh, filling in the the cements at the end of these uh, new nucleotides. This stuff, base excision repair, occurs throughout the cell cycle, right? Not just at one point, but at different parts of the cell cycle, anytime there's any kind of base excision repair necessary. This is going to be important in repair of spontaneous or toxic deamination. Now, deamination reactions were on a page earlier where they told you that cytosine, when it's deaminated, it becomes uracil. Adenine, when it's deaminated, becomes hypoxanthine, and um, guanine, when it's deaminated, becomes xanthine. All right, so let me put this note right here. This is from my annotated book with some of the information regarding base excision repair. Right, these abnormal bases can cause DNA mutations, leading to carcinogenesis. So you want to make sure you do this base excision repair throughout the cell cycle and not have a problem with doing this because if you don't do it, you risk car cancer basically. All right. The last thing are your MMR, mismatch repair. So you're going to see all of these MMR genes, MMR1, 2, and a bunch of other things when you get later on to your polyp section in GIT. It's actually defective in Lynch syndrome. All right, so this guy is defective in Lynch syndrome. It occurs in the S phase. Um, Lynch syndrome association is key right here. So Lynch syndrome is your hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer, right? That's the colon cancer where the person doesn't have any polyps. So that really sucks because polyps are what we use to kind of identify the risk of colon cancer, right? When you see a polyp, you cut it out, and you usually see the polyp when you do the colonoscopy. So now it's a hereditary form of this thing, which really, really sucks because you get it from your parents, and the colon cancer starts activating at an extremely young age, like five, six years old. Um, and it usually spans the entire colon, so it's pretty bad. You gotta get rid of the entire colon for these people, uh, assuming they didn't die, which you know they, they usually don't die nowadays. You'll see it and then you fix it. Um, that's not the only thing they can get, by the way. Patients with DNA mismatch repair abnormalities are at increased risk of colorectal cancer, endometrial cancer, and even ovarian cancer. So it's got a couple issues there, right? What does this do? So this takes mismatched nucleotides in the newly synthesized DNA and removes them, right? And then the gap is filled and resealed. So if you have any mismatched nucleotides in the new DNA, the new replicated DNA that you made, maybe you put a DNA, uh, you put a nucleotide there that doesn't match the template, so it, was, it wasn't the correct partner for it. Um, once you identify the false, bad, mutated partner, you can remove it, and then you're done. Right, you, you remove that, put the correct one there, seal it up, all done. These things are nicely shown in the images of your first day 2021. They made new pictures to kind of demonstrate examples of what it all looks like. And that's what they're showing in the mismatch repair aspect too. So here they, they put an example of how 
uh, in mismatch repairs, something that you would fix would be that, you know, maybe the original template had an A here and you matched it with a G. That's false, right? That's not correct. The A needs to be matched with a T. So for mismatch repair, what you would do is you would get rid of the G and then replace it with a T, which is the correct connection, right? That's what mismatch repair is doing. This is going to be very important because um, if you don't do it, you clearly have a mistake that's not going to work too well, right? And the DNA won't connect very well. A and T connect with two things. G and C connect with three bonds, right? So the, the connection won't work too well if you don't have the, the correct things uh, bonded to each other. Uh, similarly, there's an example for the base excision repair, which works with deaminated issues. So these are your three case scenarios of deamination, right? So it fixes these deamination issues. So one of the examples they gave is that they connected G with U, right? But G is supposed to connect with C. G is supposed to connect with C, but clearly their C must have been deaminated to a uracil, and that's why this error has occurred. So you get rid of the U and you put a C there. That's what's being fixed in base decision repair. Right? And they nicely show you that before you can do this, in that little moment where you got rid of the U, you create an empty space. That's called the AP site, a periminic or AP rhenic site. And then you now put the correct thing in there and you seal it all up. Right? So it's, it's good to go. Um, that's base excision repair. And then the uh, dimer stuff, the dimer stuff is a whole different topic. So what happens over there, the example they gave you is you have two A's. So the bottom strand is the original. Okay, this is the original correct correct uh, strand. The, uh, the top strand is your um, mutated strand. All right, mutated because it's got the incorrect partner being put onto it. So on the original, you have two A's, and what they show here is that you're supposed to connect with two T's, right? Each of these is going to connect with a T, but for some reason, the T that was brought here is actually kind of connected with each other more than it will connect with this. And because these two T's are connected with each other, it really makes the DNA too tight, right? Imagine that this segment here is for some gene, and everything on this direction is for another gene. Now it won't separate too well. Right? And that's only one problem. There can be many other issues that can occur because of this. So what they do is they take this messed up dimer that's connected to each other, remove it, and put the correct non-connected dime, you know, normal T and T that are nicely connected to the, 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 the two T's should not be stuck to each other. Right? That's what they call the dimer. So they have nice pictures showing you how all that works and how it's all fixed. And you want to make sure that you never have an issue fixing one of these things. This can be tested in many ways on step. Right? You can get a question where they specifically give you an example, like one of these things that I showed right now, and then ask you how you would fix it. They can give you a verbal example of what's wrong and ask you how, how to fix it. Or they can tell you that you know this is happening and this is how we're going to fix it, and then ask you what's the first thing I'm involved what's the last step involved or any part of the various steps involved. They can also ask you what diseases are involved, which is why I mentioned the things that can be involved here, right? We got xeroderma pigmentosum for the nerd thing. And my basic surgery repair is just anything that has these uh, deamination reactions. So now you need to wonder what can cause deamination, right? There aren't that many things that can cause deamination. One of the examples of something I've seen in a question a long time ago was someone who got toxic deamination from eating too much, I believe, a nitrogenous food, I think it was smoked turkey or something like that. It was an absurd question because I don't know how anyone would really know that smoked turkey counts as having too much deaminated food or something like that, but you know, that's kind of the connection you'll have to make. There will be questions regarding things you've never heard of before, you know, but you still have to use your best judgment and all the knowledge you possibly have to kind of see what connection there might be there that you may not know of, right? Um, because if they give you a question where someone ate something, overdosed on turkey in some maybe food eating contest, and then now they have some kind of problem and they need to fix it, well, it definitely isn't going to be nucleotide excision repair because that one was related to sunlight, right? And it's definitely not going to be mismatch repair because this one's related to mainly Lynch syndrome. That's about it. Mismatch repair issues with Lynch syndrome. Uh, I don't see any other disease that they're mentioning here. I mean, I mentioned just a while ago colorectal endometrial and ovarian cancer, but even those cancers are not really necessarily related to these other guys. So, you know, the, the type of cancer is related to each of these repairs not working is pretty specific stuff. So you have to use all the knowledge as a complete picture to be able to pick the correct answer choice. All right. So that's your topic of DNA repair. Hopefully all of this was a nice shock study to get you to kind of go back and revise topics that you need to know as we move forward. 
um, and you know get this stuff down don't forget any of it have it stuck to your memory and then in the next video we'll move forward to um, the next topic of actual organization of DNA gene expression and the various things of splicing pre-RNA and preparing RNA to become tRNA and finally make protein thanks a lot for joining I'll see you guys again later